Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on this very special edition of Conservation in the Classroom. My name is Kate, and I will be your host today. As many of you know, WWF and DreamWorks Animation have teamed up to raise awareness about the plight of real wildlife depicted in the new animated movie, The Bad Guys. In the film, notorious criminals Mr. Wolf, Mr. Snake, Mr. Piranha, Mr. Shark, and Mr. Tarantula are finally caught after a lifetime of legendary heist. To avoid a prison sentence, the animal outlaws must pull off their most challenging con yet, becoming model citizens. Both WWF and DreamWorks want audiences to know that although they're depicted as criminals in the movie, animals like wolves, sharks, snakes, tarantulas, and piranhas do a lot of good within their ecosystems. After all, there are no bad guys in nature. Here to talk about it with us today is the director of The Bad Guys, Pierre Perfell, and WWF's Northern Great Plains Program Officer, Noelle Guernsey. Pierre and Noelle are going to share with us how animals, such as the characters in the movie and the real life animals that Noelle works to protect, are important despite their misguided reputations and why biodiversity is essential for the health of our planet. So I'd first like to welcome Pierre and Noelle. Let's bring them on screen to say hello. Thank you both so much for being here. Hey, Kate. Hey, Noelle. Hi, everyone. Hey, everybody. So before we get started, let's meet our other special guests that we have invited to join us on camera today. So first up, coming to us from West Palm Beach, Florida, we have our fourth graders from Belvedere Elementary. Hello. <laughs> Next, we have our fifth grade class from Riverview Charter School in Beaufort, South Carolina. <laughs> Next up, coming to us from Springfield, Oregon, we have Miss Klim's fifth grade class from Elizabeth Page School. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, we have Miss DeWitt's fifth grade class from Cougar Creek Elementary in North Lakewood, Washington. <laughs> Ooh, you all look fantastic, and we cannot wait to hear your questions. A quick reminder to those of you watching from the webpage to place any questions that you have for Noelle or Pierre in the form that you can find underneath the video stream so that we can get to as many of those questions as we can during the Q&A at the end. So without further ado, let's get started. So Noelle, Pierre, we are thrilled to have you both here. We thought it would be a great place to start by having each of you tell our audience a little bit about your role and your experience with WWF and DreamWorks respectively. So Noelle, let's start with you. Can you explain to our audience here what you do at WWF? Yeah, hi everyone. I work for World Wildlife Fund's Northern Great Plains program, and I'm a wildlife specialist where I get to work to restore two different species. If you see the species in the top center, that is the black-footed ferret, and in the bottom center is the plains bison. So I work to restore these populations of these really important and iconic grassland species. Awesome. Now, Pierre, as the director of The Bad Guys, what was your favorite part about working on this movie? Well, I, hey everybody, first, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the director of the film. I, well, the, the, my favorite part, I think, was uh, actually, you know, using the stereotypes of these scary animals that we, we have here, you know, wolf and a snake and prana and a shark and a tarantula, line, kind of debunking a little bit the bad rep that they have. Uh, and, and really also having fun doing it, you know, like it's using the big bad wolf that we all know and, and just putting him or placing him in a different kind of situation where now he's a charming bank robber, but, you know, throughout the whole story evolves and becomes, you know, the, 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 the good person, the good citizen, along with his whole crew um, that we all know he can be because, you know, he's got a big heart in the end and wolves do. So I know we're going to talk a little bit more about the characters in a few minutes, but would you say that there were any character, any of the characters in particular that you had a particular attachment to? Like what character did you resonate with the most? I would say for me, it's Mr. Wolf. Um, it's Mr. Wolf because uh, he's the character that really is the center of the story and he he's the character that grows the most, you know, he's the one that uh, makes everybody around him change, uh, at least all his friends. 
uh, and and go through that big life changing experience that it is from becoming uh, from being a, a a gangster or bank robber uh, or bad person a bad guy really uh, to somebody who really wants to belong and be loved and and actually does it you know and I think um, I love his style I love his look I love that he's a wolf and he can be also a wild animal when he wants to but I think really what I what I really you know, connect with with this character is that that idea that he can reinvent his life, and he did. You know, and I think what a great answer. <laughs> so, to give our audience a little more insight on the movie and its characters, I think we're going to show a clip now. So, Pierre, why don't you um, tell us a little bit about the scene we're about to watch? Yeah. So, in, in the movie, our our bad guys are those five bank robbers and criminals, and one day they decide to steal something that is deemed unstealable and they want to be the first ones to actually do it uh and they actually kind of do but uh just before they manage to escape uh and leave with that trophy uh mr wolf stops because on stage is someone mr marmalade professor marmalade who's a guinea pig and that guinea pig basically whispers in his ear kind of thing that being good feels so good and it kind of stops him in his track and uh, let's watch the clip. It just feels so good. And when you're good, you're loved. <laughs> it's the bad guys! Arrest! And you can't prove that. My baby! On your knees, bad guys, with your hands up. Never! We're out of here! So long, suckers! Well, this just got a little weird. <laughs> Very funny. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the main character, Mr. Wolf, especially since that's the one you said you resonated with the most. So can you share with us a little bit more about his character, like his personality and what kind of struggles he may have as being the leader of the pack? Yeah, uh, he, you know, wolves have that, uh, have been having that bad reputation forever, right? And, uh, you know, it started probably in the mid Middle Age in, 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 in Europe where, where wolves were, you know, feared by, by farmers and, and who were fearing for their sheep and goats and because, well, they were everywhere in, in, uh, in Europe and we started killing them really and, uh, and started to actually write stories about them, about the big bad wolf and, and he became that kind of iconic character, that iconic bad guy. Uh, and so he's the big bad wolf. And I think he grew up with that kind of identity, you know, thinking that even though he deep down, he knows it's not true. He knows he's got a big heart. You know, he had to conform to whatever everybody was saying about him. And therefore, he decided to become a bank robber, you know, because if you guys want me to be a bad guy, I'm going to be a bad guy. I'm going to show you what it is to be a bad guy. So he's incredibly, you know, because these animals are very smart, very resilient. Um, and and this is who he is, really. He's that impulsive guy, but that also incredibly charismatic, very clever, very, very, uh, very smart and um, kind of leading the gang, you know, kind of showing the way uh, thanks to his charisma. Uh, and and trying to keep that feeling of family within that gang, just keeping that cohesion within within that gang. He's also an incredible pick, pickpocket, uh, a, a crazy good car driver, <laughs> and a very a, a, a fantastic master planner. Uh, and so, you know, all his life they've been really uh, stealing, 
stealing, robbing bank and, and, and robbing museums and, and art galleries, but really not for the money, just, just for the fun of it, you know? And, uh, and I think they grew up with that identity that, well, they will never be accepted anyway. And, but deep down, I think he longs for something more. He kind of longs to be like a just normal guy, you know, to not be hated so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's what kind of what that story is telling you know that's kind of the story of this movie you know um but i like him also because he's not just a one note kind of character you know he can be sad and he can be angry and he can be you know uh goofy very goofy and also incredibly smart and incredibly suave and very charming but i love those moments where we kind of showed a little bit of his raw wild well wildness you know where he can actually be a, a real scary wolf if he wants to be you know and so uh so yeah that's that's our main character yeah mr wolf so you really get to see a lot of different sides to mr wolf not just the one that everyone would probably think of automatically as his right. reputation right. that he's living right. up to right. exactly. um, so while we're on the subject of wolves noel you actually live and work in an area that is very close to wolf habitat the northern great plains so can you tell us a little bit about wolves and why you think they get such a bad reputation? Yeah, absolutely. Just like Yara said, you know, wolves are often really misunderstood and are thought of as being vicious and dangerous. But in reality, they are really quite shy and they tend to try to avoid humans. They are also super important for the ecosystems where they live. And we will get to talk about that in a little bit. And most of the times that I've been able to uh, see wolves, which every time feels super lucky and special, it is usually for just a quick fleeting moment because they do tend to be so shy. I often have seen most of the wolves that I've been lucky enough to see in national parks like Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park. And this is a picture of one of the wolves that I got to see um, once while I was all by myself, but it was really only for just a couple of minutes. So let's uh, learn more about this amazing species. So here you see moose and elk and moose and elk are really important herbivores that eat all different kinds of vegetation. And they're a really important prey species for wolves. Wolves are considered apex predators, which means that they are top predators and they help maintain balance in ecosystems. Wolves tend to hunt the old, the young, sick and weak individuals. And scientists have even documented that wolves will hunt out moose that have arthritis. So they're really um, important in helping maintain balance of those herbivore population and ensures that there's a balance for the vegetation. Because without predators, if herbivore populations get too high, it can damage the vegetation. The other important role that wolves play is that the carcasses from wolf uh, kill sites provide many meals for scavengers and small creatures ranging from birds to microbes. And then those wolf kill site carcasses, they decompose and provide really important nutrients to the soils that then benefit the vegetation. So the other thing that's really great about wolves is, you know, all animal species, especially those that are really misunderstood, have amazing unique traits, just like all of you have unique traits. And when you take a look at wolves, they live in these tight knit social groups. And one thing that's fascinating about them is their communication. They communicate in many ways. So if you see that top left picture, they um, use a lot of body signals and body communication. They also use a lot of um, uh, audio. So they'll howl, they'll growl and use other types of ways to communicate with their pack members and other wolf packs. And then they also use things like urine and scat to also communicate with other wolves. And so um, I just want to iterate that each animal species, especially those that are misunderstood, have really fascinating um, facts about them and how they live. So wolves communicate just as much as we do. <laughs> So we actually have quite a bit in common with them and they might not be as scary as everyone thinks they are. Um, the Can wolves I, are, yeah, go ahead, Pierre, sorry. I want, I want to ask Noel a question. Can I ask you a question, Noel? Yeah. Is it true that they, wolves tend to mate for life? 
So wolves, they typically have an alpha and uh, an alpha female and an alpha male that will um, be the mating pair for that pack. And typically they will stay a pair until a challenger is able to come and, you know, claim that dominant alpha spot. But it's just that two pair for as long as possible. Typically in most packs, yeah, there's usually just one breeding pair. Interesting. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. So wolves are not the only animals that do a lot for their ecosystem, despite the fact that many people view them as bad guys. In the movie, we also get to know Mr. Piranha, Mr. Snake, Mr. Shark, and Mr. Tarantula, all animals that have a not so great reputation, but they all play an important role in nature. Now, Noelle, you work with another species out there in the Northern Great Plains that has a pretty bad reputation. But before you tell us what it is, let's put it up on the screen and just give our audience a second to see if they can guess. So does anybody think they know what this is? He doesn't look so bad. <laughs> doesn't look very intimidating, but we'll give everyone just a second to think about it. All right, Noel, take it from here. I think it's time to yeah. reveal the answer. <laughs> yeah, well, congratulations to everybody that guessed Prairie Dog. Uh, you know, prairie dogs are a super fascinating species, and they also, like wolves, play a very important role, although it's very different than the role that wolves play. Uh, they are a misunderstood species, and the main reason for that is because, unfortunately, some people don't like the fact that they eat grass for their food, and they also create these extensive burrow networks. Because of that, prairie dogs can only be found today in about 2% of the lands where they once were commonly found. But let's uh, dive in together to find out why they aren't a bad guy, but why they're a really, really good, important guy. So over 100 animal species are associated with the presence of prairie dogs. Many animals use their burrows for their own families. So do you see the burrowing owl and the black-footed ferret that are popping up out of prairie dog holes? And then many other animals like the ferruginous hawk and the badger and the coyote that you see, they rely on prairie dogs for their food source. Prairie dogs, they also keep all of the plants near their burrows clipped really low so that they can keep an eye out for all of the many predators that want to eat them as snacks. And that short vegetation that's created by the prairie dog clipping creates really ideal habitat for some birds like this uh, long-billed curlew that you see and also mountain plovers that you see, or sorry, that is not pictured. So this animal is uh, the black-footed ferret, and I get to work to grow the number of these animals that live in the wild. And this is a nocturnal weasel, and it is one of the most endangered mammals in all of North America. And you cannot save the black-footed ferret without saving the prairie dog, because black-footed ferrets exclusively prey on prairie dogs. And they also use the prairie dogs burrows for their own homes and for raising their own babies, which are called kits. So black-footed ferrets are a small but mighty carnivore. And a lot of us like to call them the uh, bandits of the prairie. And they're an amazing animal. And many of us are working to do everything that we can to make sure that they survive so that future generations of children and people can continue to see this incredible species. So much like wolves and black-footed ferrets, prairie dogs are super fascinating also. Prairie dogs live in tight-knit family groups called coteries, and their coteries um, maintain a territory that contains many burrows. Females, uh, like the mothers that you see here, give birth to one litter a year, and the females remain in the same territories um, after for many generations. So you can often find grandmothers, mothers, and daughters all living in the same area. The other really cool fact about prairie dogs is that they have the most complex um, mammal language that has ever been decoded. They have different words for different predators and the speed of which those predators are approaching. And they react differently based on what predator is threatening their colony. So is it a coyote or is it a pet dog? Is it a human? All of their responses depend on which threat is being detected at the colony. That's very cool. So obviously, oh, sorry, go ahead, Pierre. No, I was, I was going to say this is amazing. 
the new prairie dogs were so intelligent and complex. Um, so obviously the overarching message here that we want to convey is that all animals, even the bad guys like wolves, snakes, sharks, tarantulas, piranhas, and prairie dogs, all play a part and contribute to the health of their ecosystem and its biodiversity. And speaking of biodiversity, Pierre, can you tell us why having such a diverse cast is beneficial to the plot in the movie. So having all of these different characters. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it's, I think, I think we, in a way we kind of uh, wanted to highlight or illustrate some of the most um, famous of those bad guys, if you will, you know, the, the great white shark. I mean, and again, they're all, you know, kind of representing almost their species, you know, we're afraid of snakes and we're afraid of spiders. So tarantula is kind of the, the big hairy spider and then snake is, you know, kind of a representative of all these species. And I think these two, by the way, are the probably the most hated of all the cast of bad guys that we have, because uh, there's almost a visceral reaction that we have to these animals, you know, uh, and I don't know what it is and I don't really know where it's coming from. Uh, is, are those theory, uh, stories we've been telling ourselves about how dangerous a snake is or how scary a spider is? These are beautiful animals, obviously, but, and I think, you know, we have such a diverse, uh, diverse, you know, group of animals because I think they're really the most iconic bad guys that we can find, the wolf, the snake, the shark, the tarantula. And the piranha is also that kind of a fascinating, you know, legend of South America, right? Where, you know, everybody is like, you know, you, 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 you swim in a river and then you, you're going to get eaten alive by hundreds of them, you know? And so I think he's such a kind of a, a, a a legend as well in his own right. Uh, so I think this is why we have such an eclectic cast of characters. It also really, I mean, honestly, also it comes from a book series. And so we couldn't really also reinvent all of those animals. Uh, but also in animation, it's quite fun to animate a snake that has no arms or legs. And then a tarantula that has eight legs and two arms. Uh, and and the rest are like, uh, uh, you know, a shark with a giant mouth. and. And, and, and a wolf that's pretty pretty much of a human, but also quite 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 fun to uh, to play with. So I think it's a little bit of everything, and this is where. But mostly, it's uh, really trying to represent or find iconic villains, you know, uh, that that are really misunderstood, really. And I think you are right. Even in our trivia question there at the beginning, it looked like snakes and spiders were the two most popular answers that the students submitted. So I think you're right that those two are probably the most well known for being like having those bad reputations. But Noel, why do we need even the the snakes and the tarantulas, the bad guys that may not be as nice to look at? Um, why why do we still need them? Like this tarantula, for instance. Yeah, I mean, tarantulas are also important animals. Uh, they are also nocturnal carnivores, just like the black-footed ferrets, and they feed on insects, so they help maintain the balance of those populations. And then there's a lot of other animals, like lizards and snakes and coyotes, and even a tarantula wasp, a tarantula, uh, yeah, a tarantula wasp, and they all feed on the tarantulas. And so, you know, the other really cool thing about all these misunderstood animals is that the more that you learn about them, the more fascinating they all are. Uh, this video is a, a desert male tarantula that I saw in Colorado. And these guys will walk up to 50 miles looking for a mate. So, you know, I think that if there's any misunderstood animals that you might find a little scary, just read about them and learn all kinds of cool facts about them. Oh, yeah, it's fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, just reiterating that every animal, every plant, they all have a role. And biodiversity really is the variety that's found on Earth. And each animal plays an important role in that ecosystem and maintains a balance with everything being connected. So the plants in the ecosystem provide really valuable food to herbivores like elk and the other animal that I get to work with, bison. And in turn, you know, elk and bison are really valuable food sources for those wolves. And that hunting dynamic then in turn keeps the plants and thus the soils healthy. And I really love studying ecology because all of the relationships that are found within nature, they're super complex and they're also really interesting and fascinating. 
And for all of you that are watching, you know, your school is its own ecosystem. Think about all the different roles that you all play as students and your principal and your teachers, custodians, uh, cafeteria staff, bus drivers. Uh, imagine a school that doesn't have students. You know, would that work? What about a school that doesn't have any bus drivers? Similar to your school system, biodiversity means that a whole system is healthy and can function together because all of those roles are represented. Great, well, we have one last question for both of you before we take questions from our audience here. So if you had to pick one more animal, one more bad guy, not so bad guy to join the cast that you feel deserves to have their records expunged and their reputations cleared, what animal would you pick and why? I'm gonna go with the bat. It's a good choice. I think I think because um, uh, I mean, first of all, they are like incredible designs of an animal. You know, it's the only mammal that can fly, but it's also like like able to see perfectly at night. Not see, but just like work with eco geolocation, geolocation, and just geolocate all these prey that they that they hunt at night, and with their giant ears and. But yeah, I think they're, they're they're completely misunderstood. They're scary just because of their shapes and how they fly, you know, erratically at night. And and it's just a silhouette because they come just when the night shows up. I mean, we see them when the night, you know, is is happening. And and some of them can be big and some of them can be small. And but but their and their their face is a little scary looking. But I think that's the only reason why we're terrified of them. But other than that, they are some of the most amazing uh, creatures that uh, I mean not. Uh, I mean, they're all like, like Noel said, you know, every animal has its own thing. I, I was working actually just before this movie. I used to work on a Australian located kind of a story with just animals. Um, and, and we got to work with, you know, biologists and doctors and, 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 and every single one of them is such a fascinating little machine, you know, and just like perfectly adapted to their lifestyle and their ecosystem. Uh, and when you start, like, like Noel said, like when you start diving into, these characteristics of each of these animals is just fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, but I think, yeah, I would go with bat. That's a great answer. Bats are really important too. They're pollinators, and I think they're they just, them. yeah, people just get weirded out by how they look, but they're they're really important. So, Noel, what's your choice? Well, that's a great one. I mean, I I also second. Bats are amazing, and look up a hammerhead bat and tell me that's not the cutest face ever. Really? But yeah, but I think that my um, my species that I would choose are beavers. You know, I think beavers get a really bad reputation because, you know, they will um, manipulate the environment by cutting down vegetation to build dams. And some people don't like that flooding that can happen from beavers. But, you know, beavers through their action, they really create healthy streams and they also create a lot of habitat that's important for many other species. So I'm going to go with the beaver. Both really terrific answers. So I challenge, that's everyone's homework, is to think of another animal that they would add to the cast that has a bad reputation that's undeserving. Um, okay, so we're gonna dive into our Q&A with our um, audience here. So quick reminder, anyone watching online to place your questions in that form. And we're gonna get started with our groups on camera. So let's bring in our group from Belvedere Elementary in West Palm Beach. Remember, nice and loud for us and specify who your question is. <laughs> Hi, our question's for Pierre. What part did the author Aaron Blaybe play in the making of the movie? What part, what part did he did he play in the making of this film? Yeah, he he was he's um, what we call an executive producer in the film. Uh, and if you want to to kind of illustrate a little bit of what that role is, is like a, a very important consultant. So mm -hmm. they, he's been com following us from the beginning. Of course, it's these books, and so. What happens is you sell the rights to the books so that we can make them as a movie or a TV show, whatever. Uh, but I was checking with him basically every month uh, and updating him on what I was doing. Um, and the thing is, when you 
buy the right to a, to a book like this, uh, most of the time, you're not entitled to follow anything. As a studio, you can kind of do whatever you want. You know, if you even want to change the title, you can, as long as you know you. So, but in our in our case, we really wanted just to keep him in the loop. We are not going to follow exactly the books as they were, but we wanted to make sure that he was still okay with the tone of the film and with the kind of uh, characters that the way we are writing the characters uh, and the kind of dialogue that we're uh, writing for them and the the whole so the arc of the story. So he was he was uh, quite a bit involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Let's bring in our group from Riverview Charter School. What's your first question? Make sure you specify who it's for. Um, this question by the director, what was the process of making the movie? What was the? A little louder for us. For the director. Yeah. This is the process of making, what was the process of making the movie? Oh, the process of making a movie. Oh, it's a complex process. Um, animation uh, and, and live action equally, but animation demands a lot, a lot, a lot of people. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it really briefly, or trying to explain it briefly for you guys. Um, we start with a script. You know, it's like it's a, just a document that kind of tells the story and it's written. That script, we um, turn it into storyboards. So I give each sequence of the script to some story artist, storyboard artist that we draw uh, kind of a, a sketch version of the way they would shoot this sequence specifically with drawings, just drawings. And those drawings, we take them and then we cut them together with a, an, a, my editor. In this case, it was John. Uh, my editor actually cut them together with music and, and voices and, and, and sound. Um, and so we quickly have an idea of how the script plays on screen. But usually the, the, at this point, the music we use is a temp music, so from other movies. Uh, the, the voices are not the real actors, they're scratch voices. Uh, they are scratch actors, so friends of mine or myself sometimes. <laughs> Uh, and sound effects are like temp sound effects, so not good ones, you know. But at least you can tell that the story is there. So once we have that, and that that is a process, that editorial process goes throughout the whole making of the film. Um, on the side, we also design the characters with drawings, and then we model them like puppets, like in 3D, in, in computer, right? And then inside those puppets, we put some skeletons so that the animators can move them and get them to act, right? Um, and then we design all the look of the film. We do all the sets and the, the props and everything. Same thing in 3D. Um, and then once we have those storyboards that are working, then in the sets, we, also, we now translate those storyboards into layout, which is basically filming the storyboards in the sets with a camera, with a virtual camera in, in the computer. When that's approved, then we give, the, we give that to animators. And the animators will be doing the actors of the, the 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 cg scene if you want or 3d scene so they're going to start moving the characters function of what i'm asking them to be doing but just before that we had to record the actors the actual actors to do this so we have the animation now done and then we do uh some a pass of special effects so it could be water it could be you know smoke it could be fire whatever you want and then that when we have all of this we light that we just give it a nice good good looking color uh whether it's sunset sunrise and in, interior lighting whatever you want so that's for the image. And then on top of everything, we need to also create the sound. So we have sound designers creating all the sounds. And then we can create the music. We have the composer creating the whole music. So we put it all together, and then we have a movie. I simplified Whew. it. But that's kind of the idea. <laughs> it takes a long time. Do you know how long it takes? Uh, how, how many uh, seconds of animation an animator does per week by himself? Ooh. I wouldn't even know where to guess. <laughs> An emitter does five seconds per week. Wow. So we have a 90 minute movie. You need a lot of animators because it's a lot of seconds and a lot of weeks to do it. A lot of important I, roles. Oh yeah. I was about yeah. to say it goes along with the theme of today that there are a lot of moving parts and yeah. everybody yeah. with an important role to play. Okay. If you miss one, you don't have a movie. Yeah. It's a there you go. Problem. This is a very complex ecosystem too. Let's bring in our group from Elizabeth Page School, Mrs. Klim's class in Oregon. What's your question? My question's for Noelle. What is your favorite animal and why? Ooh, that's a great question. Do I have to choose just one? Um, 
You know, I think I have many favorite animals and I think that the prairie dog, the bison and the black footed ferret are all up there. You know, I think another really fascinating animal is the octopus. Um, you know, I love how smart they are. Um, and I have to say that, you know, one of the reasons I like studying ecology is that then you can study all of them together because it's really hard to choose just one. It's like, what's your favorite color? It's the same thing. <laughs> hard. Yeah. How do you narrow that Thanks down? Great, great question, though. <laughs> and last, let's bring in Ms. DeWitt's class in Washington. What is your question? Um, a question to Noelle. Have you ever worked with any of these other bad guys, like the one, like a piranha, a shark, or even a snake? And if you already do, then what do you hope for their future ecosystem? Ah, thanks for the great question. Well, I did work actually as a zookeeper for a couple of years. And so I did get to work with tarantulas and piranhas. And I did not get to work with any sharks, but I would love to sometime. And in terms of what I hope for the future for ecosystems, you know, really, I kind of I turn this back to all of the students that are tuned in. You know, we need a lot of people that care about wildlife and e ecosystems, and that can take many different forms. You know, if you want to be a biologist or an ecologist, that's a great role. But also, if you really like communicating to people through magazines or TVs or movies about these incredible places and animals, that's a really great um, role too. So my hope for ecosystems in general is that more and more people start to understand how fascinating they are and all work together to find innovative ways to find places for not only the wildlife and the ecosystems, but also for people and communities too that are living amongst all these wildlife species. That is a perfect segue to one of the questions that we've received from the web page that we're going to ask here. It is to the question is for both of you from Miss Mayer's class um, in Jefferson Middle School in San Gabriel. They'd like to know what each of you hope that students will take away from your amazing projects. So, like Pierre, what do you hope kids take away from the movie? And Noelle, what do you hope kids take away from your work at WVF? After you, Noelle. Yeah, well, thanks for the great question. I mean, what I hope people will take away is that we have a really amazing opportunity. You know, species like the plains bison and the black-footed ferret, you know, their populations were decimated. But we as people, we have a really great second chance right now because they are still here, they're not extinct. And so there's a lot of great opportunity to recover these populations and, you know, see these species that, um, you know, really have an important role to play. I think on my end, I think this movie, this story is really about stereotyping. It's really about preconceived ideas and how we can judge uh, someone or something without really knowing it and, and giving it a, like a, a stamp, stamping it with some, you know, with a bad rap or with a, with a completely wrong opinion of that person or that animal in this case. Um, and so I think it's kind of trying to raise a little bit of uh, uh, awareness to what, how we behave and just be a little bit more mindful of you know, being inclusive and also being like, uh, um, not necessarily being too judgmental and being willing to give, you know, someone we tend to judge too quickly a second chance to kind of explain themselves and and, and really just open their hearts, you know. So I think it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a movie about being inclusive, you know. Both excellent answers. Um, I am being mindful of the time. I know we only have about five minutes left, so we're going to try to do a very quick second round of questions with our on-camera guests here. So we'll start back up at the top with our group from Belvedere oh, Elementary. Oh, um, your next question, please. Um, go, go, go. Yeah. Use your question for? Uh, for I don't know. <laughs> Can you speak nice and loud, please? Yeah, nice and loud. He forgot his question, but another question that was um, asked, how oh, long did the know. movie take to complete from oh, to end? That's a great question. It takes a long time. So I started in uh, November 2018. Well, let's say early in 2019. So it's three, a bit more than three years. But we, the studio, bought the rights to the, to the books in 2016. Uh, and 
I was not involved at this point, but there was, a, you know, a writer and a producer already working on it for a couple of years before I arrived. So let's say three years for production and then two more years for like a little bit of a pre-production slash script writing. So it's five years and it's not very long, actually. It, we actually went pretty quickly. Wow. Yeah, it's long, time. long process. Very complex. Four, yeah. uh, like around 450 person touched the film to make it. Wow. And then credited, so it's like everybody who actually made this possible is like almost 900 people. Wow. Big, big teams, you know. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, wow. It's a long time. Um, okay, Riverview Charter School, South Carolina. Yeah. Next question, Pete. Um, this, this is for the director. Does any of the movie connect to your own life? If so, what parts of the movie? <laughs> What what, the, what part of the movie connect to my life? Yes. To my personal life? <laughs> yes. Oh, wow, that's a great question. It's actually a... It's a, it's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> um, really put you on the spot there, Peter. <laughs> it does, it does um, it's it's uh, the story of Mr. Wolf, and I, I say I relate to him very much because it's a little bit of my personal story in there. Um, not that I was a bad guy and just became decided to become a good guy. I think I'm a good guy and I've always been a good guy. I think. But uh, no, it's more the illustration of that story is really a character who decides to reinvent his life a little bit and just see it from a different angle and decide to grow. And, and I think that's exactly what happened to me in the last few years, you know, and I kind of really put some of that into the characters because I knew, you know, the stages of changing and getting out of your comfort zone and and uh, and uh, and finding, you know, to try to figure out your, what a new life can be. Um, I actually went through a divorce. And so this is kind of that change of life is what happened uh, in my life. And I was able to put a lot of those emotions that I was going through into my character. And I knew that change was uh, something that uh, this character could go through. I knew exactly what kind of emotions he was going to go through. So in that sense, there's a lot of me in this character and uh and uh definitely answering your question it's really that you know it's like my personal life impacted this at least in my head this movie very much and and how i would write this you know uh even most people don't know it so totally fine it's kind of a, but at least for me it allowed me to have a massive connection with this movie you know that makes sense totally and yeah. i think if anyone you know any of you kids do watch the movie you can think about which character you feel you know most similar to or that you relate to the most um okay mrs klim's class in oregon next question uh this question is for pierre what inspired you to become an animator wow that's another great question um <laughs> have you ever seen the movie tarzan this movie um, was made, so it was 1997, so obviously you're, um, it was released in 97, so I think clearly you guys were not, were far from even being <laughs> on this planet. <laughs> um, but the, the animator of Tarzan, uh, his name is Glenn Keen, and he's a big legend in animation. He was working, I'm French, and he was working in the French studios, Disney studios in Paris uh, for his character. And I remember going to the cinema and I was 16 or 17 at the time and going to the cinema and I see, you know, they were like the, the, the French cinema was actually doing some promotion for the film and they were, sh they were showing what we call line tests and line tests are um, pencil tests that the animators do when they animate their characters at the time in traditional animation, not, not the, what I depicted, not what you see in bad guys, which is CG animation. No, it was 2D animation. And therefore to do 2D animation, you do one, one piece of paper, you do a drawing, you put another piece of paper, you do another drawing, a third piece of paper, another drawing that's slightly different. And then when you flip them, when you roll them, actually you see the movement. So that's the way we use to do animation. Uh, or we still do that, but in certain movies that are 2D movies, right? Uh, and you kind of shoot your rough drawings without the colors and everything. It was just pencil sketches on many, many layers of paper. And you would see Tarzan surfing on the branches. And, and you know, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. And when I saw that, it was in that in, in that cinema, it was magic. I saw it as, it was magical. I was like, how, what? It was insane. And I think that's where it came from for me. Uh, the idea that, you know, you could actually make a living out of animating 
sketches and, and, and like drawings, they would become alive, you know. And so from that moment, um, I think that's where it clicked for me and I and I decided to do this. Yeah. I remember that movie. It had a great soundtrack too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah. <True. laughs> okay, Miss DeWitt's class, you're up. What is your last question? Um, my question is for Noel. Um, are you still afraid of and like some of the animals in that movie or were you ever afraid of them? That's a great question. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, I've always really loved animals ever since I was a little kid. And so I think, you know, I was definitely the kid that was always like running around and catching snakes in the yard, much to my mother's dismay and stuff like that. So, you know, I think that uh, for me, I have a lot of respect for a lot of animals. And so, you know, from in general, most animals, you know, they want to avoid you. And so for me, I don't think it's so much as, uh, as fear, but I think understanding them behaviorally and what works best for them and for people keeping them safe is is really probably my, my answer. So I appreciate all of those species and it was really fun to watch the movie. So we're gonna end on one last question that got submitted online that I think is a great question for both of you to end with from Mrs. Hartman's class in Clyde Hill, Washington. They wanna know what can we do in our own neighborhood to help these different species? So essentially, if each of you had to give kids one piece of advice, what would you tell them? Don't kill the spiders in your home. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one, too. Yeah. And I would say just learn about your local wildlife and local ecosystems. You know, there's lots of different folks that are doing things to create uh, pollinator gardens at home and that kind of thing. So there's lots that you can do locally. Awesome. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time today. Um, teachers, parents, you can find more educational materials on the bad guys and biodiversity on the Wild Classroom webpage. And don't forget to join us next Thursday for our last event of the school year, which is celebrating the year of the tiger. Pierre, Noel, thank you both so much for being here today. I had a blast. I hope you guys did too. And a huge thanks to everybody watching and to, of course, our special guest that joined us on camera. Thank you all.